the Faculty of Management Science and Informatics. Uh, we have uh, we prepared with our partner Siemens Health in Years a unique uh, lecture of Mr. Uh, Joe uh, Reinsberger, who is an uh, IT guru in uh, especially agile software development. And uh, I hope that you will have a good time and uh, you will learn some new things about agile software. So mm. I would ask, I would uh, like to ask. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Van Lichek uh, from Siemens Hoffman to uh, say some words about uh, Mr. Uh, Reinsberger and then we will uh, start. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, so just short, short few sentences about how we are working or cooperating with the JB. Uh, basically, I think this is the fifth year, fifth year when uh, we JB visited our company. We started mostly in the area of test-driven development. Yes. So he did se several training or several mm -hmm. rounds of the training for, for us. Uh, we see these areas as quite important uh, in our company because we are providing the software for the healthcare domain. And this is, uh, this is um, business where the uh, quality of the software is very important. So test-driven development is one of the most important things which we are using in our daily life. So he did all also several meetups, mostly in Bratislava. Mm -hmm. uh, last year he did it also in the in the Košice, and uh, this year he is the first time here in Žilina. So today we spend the whole day. He is trying to improve our teams uh, with several uh, problems and topics which uh, we are focusing on. And now uh, uh, I am happy that we can do also this meetup on the university to show you. Uh, the way how Joe is thinking and uh, also I think we, we would like to use this way of thinking also in our company so I am just uh, handing over the word to the <laughs> to the Joe and he can start with his presentation. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, I'm not going to need this so if we have, we do, perfect. We will go a little bit retro. Uh. So, first things first. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, here's how you can get in touch with me. jbrains.ca for Canada. That part is very important. It's important for every Canadian to identify themselves as a Canadian. Otherwise, you would be confused. So I wanted to make sure that's the case. Uh, this is how you can find me. Um, and so I recommend that two things I want to say before I really start. Uh, one of them is that this is going to be a fairly personal uh, talk. So if you are really only interested in deeply technical content about programming and design, I'll give you a little bit of that, but maybe less than you were hoping. That this is going to be a little bit more about people uh, and not in this touchy-feely psychological way, but in a, I hope, a very practical way. That's my intent anyway. The second thing I want to mention is that uh, maybe there's a point while I'm talking here where you didn't understand something and you are worried that if you, if you don't understand what's happening, then the next 10 minutes will just be confusing for you. If that happens, then please just ask a question. However, maybe I'll say something you don't agree with. Maybe I'll say something that's a little bit surprising. Maybe this will trigger in your mind some question you want to ask me afterwards. So what I ask you to do at that point is to write it down. Now, you can use your phones if you don't have paper and pen. If you do have paper and pen, use that. My reason to ask you to do this is that, uh, and it's actually part of one of the things that I want to talk about. We have this tendency, especially as programmers, especially as young programmers, and especially as young men programmers, I'm sorry to say, to believe that it is a sign of strength to carry 1,218 pieces of information in our head. We do this while we are debugging, we do this while we are planning, we do this while we are working, and we believe that it's a sign that we're a real programmer. And I would like to say no. It's probably a sign of, and I don't usually like to use this word, but it's appropriate, I consider it a sign of maturity to recognize that your mind is a limited space and that you should use more of your mind to focus on the problem 
and less of your mind to remember something you want to do in two hours. And that's why I encourage you to write those questions down, to get them out of your head so that you can be here and focus on what is happening. And then when there is a pause, and I want to try to take as many questions as we can, then it will be easy for you to, answer, to ask your question later. I don't mean save your questions for the end. I just mean don't waste your brain energy remembering a question so that you can ask it later. If you need to ask it right now, ask it now. And if you are prepared to ask it later, write it down so that you don't think about it until it's time for questions. Your mind will thank you. Okay. So now, what is the topic for tonight? So I've been, uh, I've noticed a pattern in, uh, in my work with programmers. So I work at, primarily as a consultant. I mean that in a good way. I also work primarily as a coach. Again, I also mean that in a good way, like really a coach. One of the problems we have in the agile software development world right now is that people are using the term agile coach to mean part-time scrum master. And that's not what a coach is. A coach is someone who helps you figure out what are you doing that interferes with your ability to do work and helps remove that interference, right? A trainer is someone who helps you build up your capacity. You learn new skills, you learn new techniques, you practice those techniques, you become good at them, and they help you do your work better. They help you perform better. If you think about sports, then trainers are interested in things like improving your fitness, or improving your coordination, or improving your balance. Coaches don't, the act of coaching is not uh, to emphasize building up capacity, but it's to emphasize reducing interference. Interference means something that stops you from using your capacity. You might be very fit, and you might have good coordination, but if you don't understand what's happening on the field, then you're going to waste a bunch of energy running in the wrong direction. You're going to waste a bunch of energy defending against the wrong person. You're going to waste a bunch of energy doing the wrong thing. And so a coach tries to help you figure out what is interfering with your ability to do work so that you can use more of your capacity. And in my work as a coach working with programmers, I notice this pattern where we start with a programming problem. So you and I will sit down together at the computer. You will describe to me some task you are working on, some problem you want to solve, something strange is happening. And we start to work on the code. And at some point, as we are working on the code, I will try to do something simple and you will say something like, oh, well, we can't do that. And that'll surprise me. And then I'll ask, well, why can't we do that? And you'll say, well, we can't do it because the architect has decided we're not allowed to do that. Or we can't do it because when I do it this way, the product owner gets angry at me. Or if I do it this way, the manager gets angry at me. Or if I do it this way, the lead programmer is angry at me. Or I'm not allowed to make that decision because the lead programmer already made that decision and I am just supposed to do what they tell me to do. And you'll notice that in all these points, in all these objections, none of those objections have anything to do with programming. Those objections have everything to do with other parts. And the two other parts are the things that I kind of want to work, that I want to talk about tonight. There will be a little bit of programming and I'll talk about how that helps. But where I really want to start is actually, let's start with something deeply technical. Let's start with the theory of constraints. If you are worried that there would be too much psychological nonsense and not enough practical hardcore stuff, let's start very hardcore. So how many people believe that they know what I mean when I say the theory of constraints? Good. So that gives me a chance to do a little bit of explanation. Here is maybe a two minute introduction to the theory of constraints. And by the way, if you find this topic interesting and you want to read something, then I, hardly, then I highly recommend that you read the book The Goal by Ellie Goldratt. Don't worry about that now. You can find it later. What, does the theory of, what is the theory of constraints and why do we use it? I use the theory of constraints as you can think of it like a meta-thinking process. 
This is going to sound like I'm trying to turn this into a cult. I am not doing that. The theory of constraints is a way of thinking about how to solve difficult problems. And typically these problems are embedded in a system. So when I say system, I mean it in the most general way. Here is a system. Everything in the universe is a system. You are a system. We are a system. This school is a system. This room is a system. This part of my arm is a system. There just happen to be lots of cells working on that part of the system right now. So the first thing to know from theory of constraints is that everything is a system. What that really means is that when we are thinking about a system, we should be clear about which system are we thinking about. That sounded weird, but it was true. If, since we're talking about software development, one very common system is the system of people and machines who develop features for a product. So what happens in that system? The input to that system is usually requests for features. Some business person somewhere says, wouldn't it be nice if the software did this? And they have some discussions with their friends, and their friends don't say it's a bad idea. So then the person says, ah, I'm going to ask my friendly neighborhood programmers, and they're going to build this for me. So then you go to the programmers and you say, please build this feature. And then some magic happens, and what comes out? Well, what comes out? The first thing that it is important to think about with a system is how are we measuring the outputs? What outputs are we interested in? Now, if there's a request for feature, then I guess one of the things that should come out here are features. That's why I drew F. If I ask for a feature, I hope I will get a feature. That sounds reasonable. I remember a friend of mine decided that she would drop her algebra class because she read a proof that started with either the first row of this matrix contains a zero or it doesn't. And she said, well, if you have to say it like that, then mathematics is too stupid for me and I give up. So, okay, if a feature comes in, we hope that whatever comes out is a feature. Good. But it's not enough to have this. What we're really interested in, how do we know that the feature actually does something? Like, how do we know that the feature exists and isn't just an idea in someone's head? You wouldn't think this was such a big problem, but this happened to me at a client where on the first day, they drew me this nice diagram of all the software they were building. So they had all these nice lines and boxes, and I noticed that some of the boxes were shaded in. This one was 60%, this one was 80%, this one was 40%. It was a very beautiful picture. And then I asked them, oh, that sounds wonderful. Can I see the program running from end to end? That was the sound of the answer they gave me. Like they did not understand the question. Can I see the program running from end to end? No. Why not? You did all this work. You're telling me that you cannot run it from one end to the other? No. So F is not enough. One of the things we need here is that the features should be running. So that's why I drew R. The Agile Manifesto says that we value working software over comprehensive documentation. That is, as I recall, line two of the Agile Manifesto. That's why I draw R here. It's not enough that the feature exists, just trust me. I need to see it running. And if I cannot see it running, it doesn't exist. Okay, running features are pretty good. We can do better. How do I know that the feature does what I wanted? How do I know that when I actually use this feature that it behaves the way I intended when I made this wonderful request? And so one of the things that we like to do is test things. So that's why I drew T. It's not enough that the feature is running. We also want the feature to be tested because this is how we gain confidence. I should say this is how we choose to gain confidence that the feature actually, whew, I'm going to do this to move this out of the way, and then I will not hit it again. This is how we gain confidence that the feature does what we wanted it to do. I asked it to do this, and I have evidence that it does that. Yes, Dijkstra is correct. Testing cannot prove that it works correctly, but 
It can give us arbitrarily high confidence that it works well enough most of the time for us. Good enough. This isn't the faculty of mathematics. We don't need a perfect proof. It's good enough for programming that we test to give us confidence that what you gave me is what I asked for. So we say here, running tested features. Now the F in features actually stands for value. I don't just want behavior, I want features. The word feature means to me behavior that somebody will buy, behavior that I care about, behavior that has some value to me. So we can, the output of this software delivery system, I like to look for running tested features. That's why I wrote RTF, running tested features, all three. And what we're interested in the theory of constraints is not just where is the system, what is the output and what are the inputs? And the system's job, of course, is to turn inputs into outputs. But the first thing that I'm interested in is the rate at which the system produces outputs from its inputs. This starts to sound a lot like ridiculous macroeconomics. Just go with me. So we choose some way to measure output, the rate of producing output. The system's job is to turn inputs into outputs and we want to measure how how often it does that, how much. We don't just want code, we want running tested features. That's how we generate value, that's how we... That is how we arrange for the outside world to send us currency units. We give them running tested features, they give us currency units, everyone is happy. That's called a business, right? So, the first thing we have here is a focus on the rate at which the system turns inputs into outputs, which we call throughput. Throughput is the rate at which a system turns inputs into outputs. Generally speaking, we want throughput to go up. Most of the goal is for throughput to go up. When you read the goal, of course, there's more than that. The goal is actually to make throughput go up while having investment go down and operating expenses go down. For the details, read the book. For you, for now, all you need to know is that we are interested in throughput. Okay, why? Because if our goal is to increase throughput and also to reduce investment and operating expenses, we need some way to understand how can we increase throughput for a system and where. It turns out that there's one very, well, there's one very obvious property of a system, and that is that every system has limited throughput. It doesn't sound like much, but trust me, it's a big deal. Every system has limited throughput. If it was not limited, then the throughput would be infinity, we would all be rich and we would go home. So at some point, we know that the system has limited throughput. But maybe more important than that is, where is the limit? Because the system has limited throughput, there must exist some part of the system where the throughput is the lowest. Because remember, every system contains an infinite number of systems inside, so even this is a little system. The throughput through this part of the system is the reason that the throughput is limited. That is the constraint. The constraint of a system is the part of a system where because the throughput here is only 17, therefore the throughput of the entire system is 17. This is the constraint. And we know that every system must have a constraint because if it did not have a constraint, the output would be infinity and we would all be rich. So, this we call the constraint or we might call it the bottleneck. The word bottleneck is a metaphor from literal bottles. Why is the neck smaller than the rest of the bottle? It's intentionally reducing the flow of water so that when I pour it, I can pour it safely. If I just poured from out here, the water would go everywhere. The bottleneck is there literally to constrain the flow of water so that I can pour it with more control. That's the reason. And of course, now that I've done that a few times, let me do this. Okay, then I won't have a mess later. Every system has a bottleneck. 
That doesn't sound very important, but it has one important consequence. Because every system has a bottleneck. If we try to improve the throughput of the system, then we should focus our energy at the bottleneck. If I improve this part of the system over here, let's say at this point of the system the throughput is 37, and I do some very important work, like I practice test-driven development, or I, learn, I add continuous deployment, or I do some other uh, silly, lean, agile thing, and I turn the throughput from this part of the system from, th from 37 up to 51. And of course, everybody gives me a raise, my manager is happy, everything is wonderful. But because this part is not the bottleneck, the throughput for the entire system is still 17. I invested a whole bunch of energy in trying to increase the throughput through some part of the system, and there was no benefit to the system. It would have been the same if I had just sat there like this. I made the same effect. And worse, by increasing the throughput at this part of the system, I risked creating problems inside the system. Imagine what happens now if this part of the system is in front of the bottleneck. Now, I don't know what this part of the system does, but now it does it 50% more, more quickly than before. So probably this part of the system creates some input for the bottleneck. The bottleneck is slow, it constrains the whole system. What happens if I produce more inputs to the bottleneck? We have a queue. And the queue gets longer and longer and longer. More work stands there waiting to be done. So, in fact, if you improve the part of the system which is not the bottleneck, in the best case, you don't make the problem, or you, in the worst, uh, yeah, in the, in the best case, you don't change anything. And in the worst case, you make the problem worse. But you almost certainly cannot make the problem better. That means you need to focus your energy on the bottleneck. You need to focus your attention on improving the bottleneck. That will improve the capacity of the overall system. And then eventually, this is no longer the bottleneck. The bottleneck moves to over here. And you know that's happening because you continue to make improvements there and nothing happens at the end. So then you switch your attention over here. And you improve that part of the system until the output, the throughput of the overall system doesn't go up anymore, and then you realize, oh, no, the bottleneck moved again, how about here? And then here, and then here, and then eventually, if you keep doing this long enough, the bottleneck will move outside of the system, and it becomes someone else's problem, and then you take a vacation. And in fact, the goal of agile software development, if you can think of one central goal, and in fact, it's right in the Extreme Programming book, the first Extreme Programming book, the second version of it, Extreme Programming Explained, has a paragraph about theory of constraints, and it says, the goal of extreme programming is to move the bottleneck out of development. For example, we try to change the situation so that the customer cannot imagine features quickly enough to keep us busy then we know that the bottleneck is somewhere else. Maybe it's marketing, maybe it's sales, maybe it's customer relations. It could be anywhere else. That's the goal of extreme programming, to move the bottleneck out of development. To make, to, to make software development, the software development machine so good to make the throughput so high that the customers cannot think of enough good things to ask us to do. Okay, what does this have to do with anything? I'm glad nobody asked. So, theory of constraints, all you need to know is that every system has a bottleneck. And that if you focus your energy on the bottleneck, then you can improve the throughput of the system. Okay? So here I will just put bottleneck. So now, let's talk a little bit more uh, in personal terms. You are a system and you live inside a system. Whatever it is that you do now, you live inside a system where you do work of some kind. Now I'm going to talk mostly about the work of programmers in, an, in a typical business that builds software, but the conversation doesn't have to stay there. 
It's just, it's better if I provide a specific context. If I talk too abstractly, then you won't follow. It'll be even more boring than it's been so far. So let's talk about a programmer working in a software development environment. For most people, most of the time, your bottleneck, well, you have a wrong picture of your bottleneck. So the most common complaint that programmers make is I don't have time to do all the things that I should be doing. I don't have time to do all this testing. I don't have time to do all this design. I don't have time to write these documents. I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to attend these meetings. I don't have time to do that. And as soon as they say I don't have enough time, they are creating a problem that is impossible to solve because you cannot create time. As far as I know, Time is one of those things that even the physicists have not figured out how to create yet. They're working on it, but they haven't done it yet. And so as long as we focus on, and so we think that time is our bottleneck. For our work, we believe that time is our bottleneck, and I want to offer you a different way of thinking. So again, I'll go back to the, I'm an old extreme programming guy, so I like to talk about the old extreme programming books. You might have heard someone say that there's no planning in extreme programming, which is why we have Scrum. Nonsense. Because there's an entire book called Planning Extreme Programming. And in this book, there was one chapter title that when I read just the title of the chapter, I stopped everything. I just, I just backed away from my computer and I said, this is going to be one of those life-changing moments. And the chapter title was very simple. Too much to do. The problem, you believe that your problem is that you don't have time to do testing. You don't have time to learn to do test-driven development. You don't have time to set up a continuous deployment pipeline in your project. You don't have time to spend all this time talking with customers about what you're supposed to be building because, damn it, you got to write code. Time is not the problem. The problem is that you have too much to do. And when you say to yourself, I have too much to do, suddenly there is a new possibility for solving the problem. Do fewer things. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Most programmers get themselves into trouble because they are trying to do too many things. They think they want to go faster, but they don't. It doesn't help them to go faster. What really helps them is to do fewer things. The centerpiece of agile software development, truly, is not to go faster. It's to figure out what we should not be doing, then stop doing it. In fact, it's one of the 12 principles of the Agile Manifesto. We're trying to maximize work not done. And if you prefer an old movie reference, then the best way to block a kick is not to be there. Karate Kid, really? Nobody? You people have to watch older movies. I'm telling you. What was that? Canadian movies? Canadian movies? Canadian movies? No. There are a few Canadian movies worth watching, but not that many. It depends on whether you count an American movie that was filmed in Vancouver. So, the, by this I mean that time is not your bottleneck. Your bottleneck, actually, is your own energy. And I know that sounds like new wave nonsense, or new age nonsense, I should say. I promise you it isn't. Literally, your energy is your bottleneck. Your ability to focus and concentrate and uh, persist at doing a task is what limits your ability to produce results. You have all the time you need, I promise you. But you're wasting a lot of it. And you don't realize you're wasting a lot of it. And by the way, this is the same thing that I tell clients. They are wasting a lot of their capacity doing a bunch of things that nobody needs to do. And if they can figure out what those things are, and they stop doing them, everything gets better. So if you accept the idea that energy is your bottleneck instead of time, suddenly things start to change. And that's where the selfish team player comes in. The idea of the selfish team player is to recognize that because energy is your bottleneck, if you do not do things, if you waste your own energy, you are limiting your ability to do work for the rest of the team. 
You're limiting your ability to contribute to the rest of the team. You're limiting your ability to do what your manager wants you to do, to do what your teammates need you to do, to do what the company is paying you to do. And so I know that the words selfish and the words team player have some negative meanings. And I want to be clear that I mean them in the most positive way. When I say selfish, I don't mean greedy. I don't mean um, ignoring other people. I mean recognizing and being aware of what's going on inside here. Selfish in the sense of more like self-aware. But also selfish in the sense that if I do not take care of my energy, then I will have less energy to give to you, the people in the team, the company, whoever you are. And when I say team player, I don't mean team player in the American sense of doing what's best for other people and ignoring what's good for yourself. I don't mean team player in the sense of agreeing with bad ideas because somebody else had them or doing what somebody else tells you to do just because they earn more money than you do or they are a little bit higher on the organization chart than you are. I don't mean team player in the sense of going along with a bad idea because everyone else agrees that we're going to do it and it'll be fine. I mean team player in the sense of being willing to give your energy to the rest of the team to improve its performance. So if you want another book to read, because you're not reading enough of them, one of them that I would recommend is called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. This is a book that provides a model for debugging why groups don't work together as teams. Why they groups of people, when a group of people doesn't work together effectively, why don't they? And this provides, as you can guess, a five-stage model for understanding how is it that we can start to help a group of people work more as a team? And by team, what they really mean and what I really mean is a group of people who have a common purpose and who will do what it takes to improve the results of the group rather than focusing on just what it takes to improve their own results. This is related to the theory of constraints because sometimes it's better to waste some resources in this part of the system in order to improve the bottleneck. Remember that if you make the bottleneck go faster or have more throughput, then you can make the system have more throughput. But if you make some other part of the system have higher throughput, you might actually slow the system down. So that's the sense in which I mean team player. Someone who uses their excess energy by giving it back to the team, by doing what it takes to help the team's results improve which could mean doing something that isn't the normal part of my job, even though I do it only 20% as well as the specialists. Because, well, there's nothing else for me to do, and at least if I do it 20% as well as they do, that's better than zero. And I shouldn't say 20% as well, I mean 20% as quickly. If my throughput is 0.2 of yours, then the two of us together at least are 1.2. That's better than just one. And it's no value for me to get better at doing this work that isn't on the bottleneck if I can help you work on the part that is the bottleneck. That's what I mean by team player. So, okay, how does selfish and team player go together? The basic idea is to recognize that energy is my bottleneck. That limits my ability to do things, including contribute to the rest of the team. So when I, adapt, when I adopt different ways of working, I'm not adopting different ways of working because my manager said it's a good idea, because the, I care about the company's results, or because it will make me some, it'll just make me better in some abstract way. I do it because I recognize that energy is my bottleneck, and the techniques that allow me to work better help me reduce stress. And reducing stress is one of the simplest ways to, uh, to uh, attack the idea that energy is my bottleneck. So, for example, if I introduce test-driven development as a practice in my daily work as a programmer, I'm not doing it just because the design will be better or because I'll have more confidence in being able to change the code or any of that kind of stuff. What really matters is that when I write code and I see the tests pass, I do this. <sighs> I feel less stress in that moment. And because I feel less stress in that moment, I am more able to bring my attention to the work of making the next test pass. And as I see that test pass, 
I feel less stress and that allows me to focus and concentrate and be more attentive to making the next test pass and so on. It's not just this idea that the design will get better. It's not just this idea that I'll lower the cost of defects. All those things are true and they're all valuable. And since one of my clients is here today, of course, I care about those things. But at the core, really what makes that work well, what makes it really effective, is that it allows you, the programmer, working in that environment, to feel less stress. And when you feel less stress, a whole bunch of things get better. So, with test-driven development, for example, we can talk about this from a pure theory of constraints point of view. So let me do that. Many of you are familiar with the so-called waterfall, right? That's this diagram that you remember. You've probably seen it in, uh, in some old magazines somewhere. This should be a C, so let me draw it better. So that's this idea that you first you gather all the requirements because they're like berries on bushes waiting to be picked. You gather all the requirements, and then when you have all the requirements, then the very smart senior programmers sit down and they figure out the design. And then they spend two months figuring out the design and drawing it on pieces of paper, very big impressive pieces of paper, very big whiteboards. They're all over the place. And after two months of doing that, then they say, okay, you stupid programmers, now see my beautiful vision? Type it into the computer for me. So then you, the stupid programmers, sit and you type it into the computer properly and eventually, of course, while you're doing that, the testers are sitting there waiting because they know that you're going to do it mostly wrong. So they're waiting for the opportunity to start looking at your code and saying it's wrong here, it's wrong here, it's wrong here, it's wrong here, it's wrong here. So you try fixing it and then eventually we can put that somewhere in a system, in a production environment or we can ship it to a customer where they'll be able to use it. So back in 1970, this was considered to be a model for how to develop software. And in that paper, by the way, Winston Royce on page two tells you that this is a bad idea. And on page four, he actually shows you that in every phase you actually do have feedback to previous phases. This is risky and invites failure. It works on only the most straightforward projects. Therefore, it became the standard for professional software development for 30 years. It's amazing what happens when one bad idea gets out. Now we can use theory of constraints to help fix this problem. So let's focus in on the part where we write code and then we write and then we do some testing. And the problem with this is that somebody somewhere will find a mistake. And we don't know how many mistakes they will find. Some percentage of the code will be wrong and we don't know how much that will be. So then you'll try to fix that code and then there'll be some more testing and we'll find more problems and we don't know how many we'll find. So then you'll change the code a little bit, we'll do more testing and we don't know how many times we will go around this wheel. Part of the problem is that we don't know how many times we have to go around this loop before somebody somewhere says, okay, you've been playing around long enough, we actually need to put this code into production, it's fine. So here we have a bottleneck. We know it's a bottleneck because it is doing the same work over and over again, but we don't know how much of that work we have to redo and we don't know how, and we don't know how many times we have to go through this cycle before it's good enough. Nobody can predict that in advance. So it's very likely that this is a bottleneck in your system. If it isn't, you're lucky. How do you solve this problem? Well, one of the ways that you can solve this problem is by reducing the cycle time. This is one of the key ideas in Agile software development, that we do this by reducing the cycle time. So what we do is we do this in smaller cycles, and in fact, even better, this is a special case where you do some work and then you find out if the work was correct. So you do some work and then you look at the work and say, is this good enough? And then you do some more work, is this good enough? It turns out that in this kind of system, we can, the bottleneck is the testing. One of the consequences of bottleneck theory is that the bottleneck is such a precious resource that if you ever give it something to do that's bad, you're not just wasting time at the bottleneck, you're wasting the time of the whole system. One of the deepest ideas in theory of constraints is that if you're the constraint, 
And if I waste one hour of your time, I don't just waste one hour of your time, I waste one hour of the entire system. And you will never get it back. So if the system costs 1 million euro per hour to operate, but we only pay you 30 euro per hour, if I make you do one hour of wasted effort, I didn't waste 30 euro, I wasted a million. And it doesn't matter how fast everyone else goes. It doesn't matter what the throughput is in the rest of the system. Testing is the bottleneck here, because only at this point do we decide if the code is good enough to continue on. So we solve this problem by putting the two activities in the other sequence. And we do them in short cycles. We write, a we write a test so that we know which code to write, then we write just enough code to make that pass. Then we write another test to clarify what we need next, and then we write enough code to make that pass. And we call this test first programming. And the idea is that when we do test first programming, the throughput through this part of the system goes up because we've addressed the bottleneck. We no longer write code that will not pass the tests. We only write code that is guaranteed to pass the tests because we already have the test. I will not write code that fails to pass the tests. Well, closer to the truth, less often I will waste time writing code that is not going to work. If I make a mistake, I find it within 10 or 15 or 20 seconds or maybe two minutes instead of three months. And the throughput through that part of the system goes up. Well, what's the throughput through this part of the system? What comes out of here is code and what comes out of here is working code. So the throughput through this part of the system is working code. Working code per month, per week, whatever you want. And by the way, we can use exactly the same, so before I do say that, if I replace this part of the system now with test first programming, if bugs were our bottleneck, then the throughput through the entire system just went up. Congratulations. We'll be able to get more running tested features per month that way. Now I can use exactly the same trick more than once. Between design and test first programming, if I try to figure out uh, here, I'm trying to organize the code. And then here, I'm trying to type it in correctly. But how can I organize code before I have code? And yet somehow people try to do this. It happens quite often that I have an idea about how to organize the code, and then when I try to write the code, I didn't think of everything up front. Maybe I had an idea to design this part in such a way that's different from that part, and when I put them together, the wires don't match. Here I'm producing output in one format, here I'm expecting input in a different format, and nobody wrote the converter in the middle. Or worse, I thought this part of the code would take some of this responsibility and I thought that part of the code would take, this, uh, would take part of that responsibility. So we both did it, but in a different way. And they don't match. And I wasted time. So how do we solve that problem? Well, we use exactly the same trick again. So instead of this, uh, yes, we do a little bit of test first programming, then a little bit of design, then a little bit of test first programming, and a little bit of design. Well, wait a second, how does that work? Well, I start with a test, I write code to make it pass, and then I look for opportunities to improve the design. That's that thing called refactoring. The only difference between refactoring and design is that when we say design, we tend to think about designing up front before we write the code. And with refactoring, we're designing every time as we go. And the objective here is we only, we only organize the code that we have, and we only organize it enough to solve the current problem. And then we add a little bit of code that makes the design a bit worse, then we figure out how to make it better. Then we add a little bit of code to make the design worse, and we figure out how to make it better. What is the throughput through this part of the system? Well, if the throughput through here is working code, then this is well-organized working code. What does that really mean? We organize code only because it's difficult to know how to change code when we need to change it. Any professional programmer has had the experience of being in a planning meeting and someone describes a feature and they say, yep, I understand you perfectly. That'll take one week. And then you go into the code 
and you look at the parts of the code that you will need to change in order to build this feature and then you have that really bad feeling. You say, hmm, I think this is going to take one month. It will take three weeks to understand what the hell this code is doing and then one week to do it. That is what design is. Design has the only goal of organizing the code so that it is easier to figure out which parts to change. And if you're lucky, when you find the parts to change, you only need to change one part. If it's really well organized, you know exactly which part to change, and when you change this part, that's enough. So what we're doing is, we're trying, instead of trying to guess how to organize the code before we write it, we write the code and reorganize it as we go. And what, goes, what comes through this part of the system is well organized code that's also working. Code that we can change with less cost. So if we do this, the throughput through that part of the system should go up. And it does. And we call this test-driven development. So now we can replace this part with test-driven development. And assuming that figuring out which part of the code to change is your bottleneck, you just made the number of running tested features per month go up. And again, for most professional programming groups, at first they focus on test-first programming so that their bug rate goes down, and that's no longer their bottleneck. Once they can routinely write code that works, then their bottleneck is usually that I don't know how to change it after I've written it. So then they focus on this problem, and that goes away. Now, you can imagine that we can use the same trick again. Instead of going through all the details, I'll say it this way. At this point now, the bottleneck is probably making features work. So it would be a very bad idea for the business people to ask us to build something that won't sell. It's a very bad idea for them to ask us to build anything that the market doesn't want. And it's also a bad idea to ask us to build something and describe it wrong. This is a very common problem, right? Business person and the programmer sit together to try to understand what the software should do. The business person is not a programmer, so they have difficulty describing it. The programmer builds the wrong thing, and the business person says the magic words, that's not what I meant. And if you say that's not what I meant, after three months of work, we cry. But if you say that's not what I meant after a half a day of work, then I can say, oh, I'm sorry that we wasted half a day. This is what you really meant. Ah, okay, let's build that. Unfortunately, there is this problem that the business person probably doesn't know exactly how to describe what they want until they see it first. This is the nature of people's psychology, the nature of how the brain works. I don't know which details to tell you because I don't know which details you need to know. Here's a simple exercise. Tell me about your house. Don't actually do it all at once, but imagine that somebody says to you, tell me about your house. It's a very high level idea. Now you can be sure that one of two things will happen. If I just ask you, tell me about your house, either you will say one sentence like it's big and blue and it doesn't tell me very much, or you will talk to me for 23 consecutive minutes about your house. And after the first three minutes, I've stopped listening. This is a very common problem. When you ask me a question like that, I don't know which details are interesting to you. So my only two possibilities are to give you not enough detail or far too much detail. It's very unlikely that I will give you the amount of detail that you were expecting. And that problem happens here a lot. When somebody asks you to build software and you try to build it, they probably don't know how much detail you need to be able to understand what they're doing. So if they just tell you a bunch of things, either they give you a paragraph, which is not nearly enough information, or they give you a 1,218 page specification document, and you can't even read it. There has to be something in the middle. So we can solve this problem by, we ha or I should say, now we know that we have the same problem. How do we make this better? We do this. We start with one very tiny part of the product and we try to build it. And the act of trying to build it, by the way, 
The act of producing well-organized working code that seems to solve their little tiny problem is enough for them to start looking at it and say, ah, that's not what I meant. Or yes, that's great, keep going. And then you keep doing this again and again and again and again. And this is what we call behavior-driven development. Incremental product development. That magic thing in Scrum where you deliver an increment of the product at the end of every month, that's this. Well, this is the part where you build an increment of the product. Delivery is the last step. What's the throughput through this part of the system? Valuable, well-organized working code. Valuable meaning that it solves a problem that the business actually wants solved. Well-designed meaning, or well-organized, meaning that we can figure out which parts to change and we can change them safely. And working, meaning that it does what we expected it to do. And if you do this, then the throughput through this part of the system should go up. And assuming that this is your bottleneck, you are now delivering more running tested features per unit time. The last step is easy, M is for maintenance. Nowadays, we've mostly solved this problem. We call it continuous integration or continuous deployment, right? Valuable code is no good if the user can't use it. So you start by deploying the simplest version of your application, and then you see if the world is using it. And if they are using it, then you build more. And then you deploy it, and they use it more. And you keep going, and you keep going, and you keep going. So if we turn this, if we use the same trick here, then this becomes continuous delivery. And then there's one last step, which is the most important one. Because the money has to come from somewhere. Somebody somewhere has to decide to invest in you. And if, they, if, they, if you tell them, just give me some money for a year and I promise you'll get some software, probably they will say no. And even if they say yes, it's a bad idea because you start to... I'll tell you what, if I did this, I would lose an awful lot of money. So what if instead we built something and then we ver verified that the, that the market was buying it? And then we built more stuff and we verified the market was buying it. And we built more stuff and we verified the market was buying it. Then throughput through that part of the system should go up and we call that lean startup. Okay, why did I talk about all this? The short version is you can see how this idea of bottleneck theory can help us justify adopting some of these practices like test-driven development, like behavior-driven development, like continuous delivery or continuous investment, which is another way of saying lean startup, right? Limited continuous investment. This is all nice and as far as I'm concerned, it's not the most important part. This is the story that we tell our customers. This is the story that I tell my clients because uh, it's the socially acceptable story. We talk about it in terms of business, but I want to talk for a little bit now about this from a purely personal point of view. If energy is your bottleneck, then why would you do test-driven development? Well, here's an idea. If you've ever sat there and started to write code to solve a problem, at the beginning everything is wonderful. You just sit there and you start typing and typing and typing and you understand what you're typing and you can read it and it makes sense to you. And gradually, as you keep typing, the program gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then at some point, you start having this feeling in your chest like, oh, I don't know if this works anymore. So then you have to pause and maybe you pop open a debugger. And you look through some part of your code and you try to decide if it works. Well, guess what? You've just gone back to this waterfall way of thinking where the bottleneck is actually your ability to be able to figure out what the hell you wrote. And I don't know about you, but when I start to feel nervous about the code that I'm writing, then I start to make more mistakes. And if there's one thing that I've noticed, that the cost of the mistakes dominates the cost of doing any task. In programming in particular, it happens. The amount of time that you spend recovering from a mistake totally dominates the cost of actually finishing that programming task. Everything's going fine in that assignment until you reach the point where something stops working and the deadline is getting closer and you're sweating more and you make more mistakes and more mistakes and more mistakes. Your stress goes up and it just gets worse. Compare that to doing test-driven development. 
In the beginning, it's a little bit weird because you have to figure out what it is exactly that am I trying to accomplish. Let me write that as a test. If I do this, then I do that. When that happens, then the, this light should turn blue. Yeah, it requires a little bit of stress to write that, but then when you write that, you look at it and you say, yeah, I understand that. That makes sense. It's only seven lines of code. No problem. Now I'm going to write code to make it pass. And every time I run the tests and I see a green bar saying the tests pass, I feel confident that the code that I wrote works. And then I can do it again. I can write the next test, and yeah, there's a little bit of stress in trying to figure out what's going on. But once I write that test, then I feel confident I can write code to make that test pass. And when I see that both tests pass, again, what I'm doing at this point is I am constantly reducing my own stress, which means that I have more energy to focus and concentrate on what I'm doing. So in the first way of working, when I'm just writing code, and every so often stopping to see if it was correct, my stress is going up over time. My focus is going down, my concentration is going down, and I'm finding it harder to do what I'm trying to do. Every little mistake makes me feel worse. And we have this compounding loop where the more mistakes I make, the more stress I feel, which causes me to make more mistakes, which causes me to feel more stress, and pretty soon I just flip a table and walk out. And that doesn't help anyone. So one of the reasons to practice test-driven development, yes, there's all that wonderful addressing the bottleneck, blah, 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 that my clients want to hear and that I want to tell them, and it's all true. But when I'm talking to individual programmers, I want to emphasize to them that the only reason I'm really interested in these techniques is because it helps me manage my own stress, which is one way of managing my energy, which is my bottleneck. So, if we buy the idea that energy is our bottleneck and we adopt practices aimed at improving our energy, which means wasting less of our energy, which means less stress, all that kind of stuff, more focus, more concentration, then suddenly techniques that are not about programming can help us do the work of programming. So the first thing is techniques like test-driven development are there because they help us feel confident in the code that we're writing. That confidence gives us more energy and we can sustain that energy for longer. When we do behavior-driven development, it's a different source of confidence. It's building confidence that you and I have similar pictures in our minds of what we are trying to achieve. The gap between what you're expecting and what I'm expecting gets smaller. That reduces the stress of me feeling like, oh, I'm going to deliver code and it's going to solve the wrong problem and the, pro and the customer's going to yell at me. We never like to sit in a meeting and have somebody tell us that, you know, your stuff is wrong here and here and here and here. But most importantly, when the, the length of time between delivering something and finding out that it's wrong gets bigger, when the customer says that's not what I meant, a month after we built it, two months after we built it, everyone cries. But if they say it a day after we built it, there's still plenty of time for us to make changes. There's plenty of time for us to understand what's happening. Even better, if you and I can sit down and have a way to talk with each other that increases the chances that the picture in your head and the picture in my head will match, I'll feel much more confident when we then sit down to write the code. It'll be easier for me to focus. It'll be easier for me to concentrate. I'll make fewer mistakes. So, Behavior-driven development is another one of the techniques that allows us to reduce stress by reducing the risk that I'm going to build the wrong thing and make you feel like you wasted your money. Or worse, that you wasted somebody else's money. Well, maybe that's not worse, but... All these techniques are not just about addressing the bottleneck of the software delivery system, but they also have the side effect of addressing the bottleneck of the personal system. That these techniques help me feel more confident in every step that I take. Because I'm constantly asking whether this is a right step to make. I'm constantly getting feedback. And in fact, in general, we don't have to talk about these things in detail. Getting feedback and working in short cycles are two practical ways of working that help us reduce stress as programmers. And by the way, not just as programmers, but anyone involved in building software. 
constantly figuring out how will I know that this bit of work was correct? How will I know that this was valuable? How will I know that people are using it? How will I know that this will turn into profit? Whatever your goals are. In a software business, generally we're trying to turn, uh, we're trying to turn feature requests into profit. In the nonprofit world, you're trying to turn feature requests into better lives for other people, whatever it is. But we adopt these practices not just because they are practically beneficial from a theory of constraints point of view, but because they are personally beneficial from a managing your energy point of view. I can feel more confident about everything I do because I am constantly seeing if what I did is moving closer to our shared goal. So that provides another motivation for adopting these ideas in Agile software development. But why stop there? Because remember, I started by talking about when I work on problems with programmers, after maybe one or two hours of trying to write code together, we're suddenly discussing problems that have nothing to do with code. So there are two other areas that I want to talk about. And one of them is organizing work. And the other is navigating people. And I realize that I'm going a fair bit over time here. So I'm going to give shorter summaries of these ones to make sure that I leave enough time for any questions. So let's start about, um, let's start with organizing work. I'm going to talk about this from the point of view of the programmer's work, but nothing that I say here has anything to do with software development. I'm just going to use the programmer as a way of introducing the ideas. It's very often, like I said, I think near the beginning, it's very often that programmers, while they're doing work, are trying to carry a lot of information in their head. It's especially uh, common if they are debugging code. You know, I'm watching the values of 23 variables change and then something weird happens and I just go, what was that? Like I didn't even notice it the first time. Oh, let me try again. Let me see if I can run exactly the same set of steps. Yeah. Well, why the hell is that 37? That's supposed to be 31. Why is it 37? It's impossible for that to be 37, and yet it happened. And then I spend hours trying to dig through the code to figure out how in the world that variable got to 37. And what's really happening is that the uncertainty of not knowing, uh, the uncertainty of not knowing what's going on is adding stress to me. And that uncertainty is causing me to try to generate a bunch of ideas about what might possibly be happening. So now I'm adding more stuff to my head that I'm, excuse me, that I'm trying to keep track of. Now you might have heard of the very famous seven plus or minus two study. This has to do with the, our capacity of our short-term memory. That generally speaking, we can only think about seven plus or minus two things at once in our short-term memory, between five and nine. And in fact, this led to a concept in psychology called chunking. I'm not going to get into the details now. If you just read the Wikipedia page, it's actually quite good. It'll give you some idea about why this is a useful idea. Chunking, by the way, is strongly related to abstraction in software development, and it's the reason why we program to interfaces. But I'm not going to talk about that tonight. What I want to talk about, though, is this 7 plus or minus 2 idea is about understanding that the capacity of your short-term memory is a lot smaller than you believe it is. So when you sit there trying to debug code watching 23 variables at once, you can't. And I'm sorry to break it to you, but your brain simply does not have enough space for that. If you want the book length justification, then you can try reading Thinking Fast and Slow. The slow part of your brain, the capacity of your active short-term memory is much, much smaller than you think it is. And every time you try to put more information in there than will fit, you are adding stress, you are reducing your ability to focus and concentrate, and that slows you down. You are making your bottleneck worse. Now what does this have to do with organizing work? It's very common as a programmer to be struggling with having a bunch of things interfering with your short-term memory while you are trying to write code, even if you do test-first programming, even if you do test-driven development. 
Somebody's going to ask you to do something. Email is going to ping. Your phone notifications are going to go off. You're going to have an idea about something you want to do later today, something you need to do later this week. Oh, I forgot to do this. Oh, I forgot to do that. All these things are rushing to your brain and interfering with your ability to concentrate. This isn't just an annoyance. This is a serious problem. And so one of the techniques for organizing work, by the way, that's what's happening, is that a bunch of requests for work are coming into your brain and you can't even control it. And the more of those requests that come in, either from other people or from yourself, the harder it is for you to concentrate on your current task, the more likely you're going to make a mistake and slow down. You're making the bottleneck worse. What can you do? Well, you can use an idea that comes from getting things done. I'm not going to turn this into a getting things done seminar. There's a wonderful book called Getting Things Done that describes an approach to organizing your work. And one of the key techniques in there is called the inbox technique. It's very simple. I'll teach it to you now and you can start using it and start feeling the benefits of it tomorrow. It's going to sound too stupid to work and I promise you it helps. The basic idea of the inbox technique is to deal with this crowding of stuff in your head. When you're doing work, always make sure to have beside where you're working a piece of paper, a notebook, something where you can write. It works better if you write. Typing stuff into your phone, it just it activates different parts of your brain and it doesn't work as well. And the idea of having that, that, that little piece of paper or booklet beside you when you're working is that's your inbox. While you are trying to focus on a task, ideas will come into your head, somebody will ask you for something, you'll remember something, you'll remember something that you need to do later that day, whatever. And in the moment that that comes in, it's taking one of your five to nine slots in your short-term memory. It's slowing you down. Write it in your inbox and get it out of your head. It sounds stupid and it works. And it doesn't matter what it is, just write it down and get it out of your head, write it down and get it out of your head. There's something wonderful that happens. When you write that down and get it out of your head, you stop thinking about it and now you have more room in your short-term memory to focus on the task that you're working on. The task that you're working on is already difficult enough. Don't make it worse by trying to remember what you're doing later that day, that you have to pay this bill by the end of the week, that you promised your significant other that you would pick milk up at the end of the day before going home, whatever it is. All those things are not helping you get your work done. Write them down and get them out of your head. The first 50 or 60 times you do it, it feels weird. And it actually feels like it slows you down. As you get better at it, as you get more practice, you start to realize that you feel lighter. What you're doing is you're making more of your short-term memory available for the task. Now, there's a few things that happen. One, it reduces your stress. It allows you to focus more on the individual task. Another thing it does is it allows you to focus more on the task, which means you make fewer mistakes. You think more clearly about the task you're working on. Remember, when you make fewer mistakes, you finish sooner. So not only do you feel less stress because you're making fewer mistakes, but you actually get to the finish line sooner. So this inbox technique is a stupid, simple little thing that starts. And I can tell you one sign that it's working. The first time this happened to me, I couldn't believe it. I was hooked immediately. I was sitting and I was working on some complicated programming task. And I was writing stuff down, practicing whatever the book told me to do. I'll try it for three months and see if it works. Eh. I wrote something down in my inbox. And then about 90 minutes later, I finished my task. Oh, I'm done. That's great. I never want to think about that again. That was horrifying. And then I looked down at my inbox and I noticed one item in my inbox which was this little task that I needed to do at the end. I thought I was done, but there was one little detail that I had to do and I looked at the book and I thought, oh, mm, I thought I was done. My first reaction was to feel bad because there was this thing in the inbox that I still needed to do to finish this task. And then I realized what really happened. I spent one and a half hours not thinking about that. I spent one and a half hours focusing on getting the task done as much as I thought I needed to 
And then there was this nice inbox over here that listed the one more thing that I needed to do before I could really say I was done. And for one and a half hours, I wasn't thinking about this. I wasn't trying to remember to do it. I wasn't trying to think about the right time to do it. I wasn't wasting any of that energy. I have so little short-term memory. Why would I waste it on trying to remember that thing if I could just write it down and then look over and say, oh yeah, that's right, I need to do that. That'll only take me three more minutes, no problem. And that was when I really realized the power of the inbox technique. What that inbox technique gives me is a way for me to focus on what I'm doing so that I can make fewer mistakes, which makes me feel less stress, confident that there's this thing sitting outside my brain which acts as a second brain. It acts as a medium-term memory, and I will not forget things. Because I know that if I write it down, I will, when I can breathe, take a look at it and do it. And yes, I suppose it's possible that I might write something down and then see it too late. And that's why you shouldn't work for three hours at a stretch. It's a good idea to work for 20 or 30 minutes. Look at the inbox. Make sure you're not missing anything important. Get back to work for 20 or 30 minutes. Small batches, right? Pomodoro technique, monotasking, whichever one makes you happy. What that allows you to do is to free up your short-term memory to focus on the current task, to do that with less stress, confident that if you forget anything, your inbox will be there to remind you. And that's what really makes the inbox technique powerful. There's so much more in getting things done than that, but that gives you sort of a place to get started. And so if you like the idea of these kinds of techniques to help you focus more on the individual task without the risk of forgetting something important, then something like getting things done will be very useful for you. I think you'd find that quite helpful. His, uh, his uh, motto or slogan is that your mind is for having ideas, not holding them. Don't waste your brain energy trying to remember things. Instead, free your brain energy to make creative problems or creative solutions to problems. <laughs> Interesting slip. Now let's talk about navigating people. This is where I will, uh, I will talk a little bit about this and then I will stop. So the idea here is uh, I can be a selfish team player by focusing on my own work by getting my own work under control so that I then have more energy to give to the rest of the group. And so I might use some of these practices related to programming in order to make myself more effective at the programming work. My goal is not to be able to produce more software per month. My goal is to produce software with less stress and more energy so that I can then invest that energy somewhere else. And the same is true for organizing work. My goal in organizing work is not just to try to do things faster, sooner, get finished more, get finished uh, earlier. My goal is really to be able to do my work with less stress, to stop trying to remember what I need to do later today, later next week, later next month, but instead to be able to focus myself entirely on the current task and get it done, secure in the knowledge that I'm looking at my inbox maybe every 30 minutes or every hour, to ask the question, should I keep working on this or switch to something else? To increase the chances that I'm, what I'm working on in the moment is really the most significant, urgent thing I should be working on. And this reduces my stress because it helps me feel like I'm doing more valuable work. I'm not just finishing tasks for the sake of finishing tasks, but I'm also constantly checking to see whether I should be working on something else. And then when something comes up, and someone asks me to do something unexpected, I can drop everything and I can work on that, secure in the knowledge that because of the inbox technique and the other parts of getting things done, I won't forget anything important. Yeah, it delays my ability to finish the current task, but obviously Peter wouldn't interrupt me if it wasn't important. Right? But now, as I get my own work under control, I started to notice that really doing my own work sooner, faster, with less stress, with more energy was helpful, but it wasn't the most important thing in my world. What I started to notice was that my ability to interact with other people was becoming my bottleneck. So uh, here's where I really want to talk about some personal stuff. Uh, this is the touchy-feely part of the program, which you might decide is bullshit. I hope that you won't, because to me, this is the most important part. All this is about 
lowering my stress enough, the first two parts, uh, you know, managing my, you know, doing, uh, writing better code and organizing my own personal work, I'm doing this in part so that I can prepare to spend energy on the harder part. By far the hardest part of working as a professional in the software uh, industry, which is navigating these strange bags of meat who don't behave rationally. I was one of these kids growing up that didn't understand people. That's why I became interested in computers. Computers did what I asked them to do. And in fact, I heard this described very recently, and it's, it's sad, but it's true. The computer was never too tired to play with me. The computer did what I asked it to do really quickly. The computer never judged me when I told it to do something strange. The computer was always there for me. It was my friend as a kid. I know that sounds sad, but it was the truth. My father-in-law was one of these kids who had the magical ability on the playground with the other seven-year-old children, he could convince them to play the game that he wanted to play, and they would be left thinking that it was their idea. I didn't have this skill. He had something that I didn't have. The good news is that it's possible to learn how to work better with other people, even if you are like me. Even if you are the kind of person who is interested in computers because bags of meat are too strange. I don't fit in with them. They don't understand me. I don't understand them. I try to tell them, I try to correct them to try to help them and they get angry at me. Or I try to tell them things that I know because I think that everybody wants to know more things. So why wouldn't you want to hear about all the things that I know? Why would that be a problem? It turns out people don't like to be felt, don't like feeling uh, made to feel stupid. These are all things that probably sound very elementary to you, but I can assure you that there's at least one person in this room who feels kind of the way I did. Like, I'm going to go back and work with the computer because at least the computer does what I tell it to do, and I understand it. Fine. How can we improve the way we interact with people? So I learned something in my mid-twenties called the Satir Interaction Model. Some people also know it as the ingredients of an interaction. Virginia Satir was a family therapist, and it didn't take long for the psychology community to understand that her work in family therapy could also be used in organizational dynamics. That companies kind of behave like families in very important ways. That means that the kind of therapy that we might use to help a family interact better together can also be helpful in helping a company interact better. Now, I, I don't want to go through the entire model. You can read about it online. Here are the parts that I think you need to know. The first part is that the Satir interaction model provides a way to debug bad interactions. That's why I was drawn to it immediately. When someone described it to me, that was the first thing I thought of was, oh, this is a way to debug why we got into a fight last week. What the hell happened? Right? Because what typically happens is you get into some argument with someone or you have some strange interaction. Maybe they walk away with this weird look on their face and you don't know why they look like that. Or you go away feeling stupid and you don't know why that happened. Or they go away with being angry and you don't know how that happened. And the Satir Interaction Model provided a way to debug what went wrong. So you can go through, there's a four-stage model where there's different things that you can check. Those ingredients are places where you can try to do some debugging. But I want to zoom in on the part that really matters. So at the end of the interaction model is something they call the response. That's the way you act. You do something and I react. You react to my reaction. I react to your reaction and we go back and forth. I'm going to use the term response for that. So at the end of the model is how I choose to respond to you, how you choose to respond to me. And then if it gets more complicated if there's more people involved because then I'm constantly responding to you and everyone's responding to me back and forth and you have these feedback loops, it gets complicated very quickly, actually complex. When you get into a fight with somebody or if somebody makes a strange face at you or they just they behave in a way that you find odd, your impulse is typically to object to their response. It seems natural because their response is the thing that you're noticing. 
But the response is the most difficult thing for people to change because of something that I call the fundamental irony of interaction. So in the model, the last two stages of the model are called significance and response. Response is obvious. Significance is a bit weird. But you can think of significance this way. I make a story in my head about why you react the way you reacted. So you've been sitting forward now, you've got your hand on your fist like this. You just smiled now. I'm making stories about why you're behaving this way. I'm trying to attach some significance to your responses. What I'm doing is I'm telling myself a story about why you are behaving this way. I'm not just worried about what you are doing. I can see you pretty clearly. And I'm not worried about decoding the signals. I sort of understand what's happening. I can see there's a little bit of a smile, but not much. That you're leaning forward, probably trying to relieve some pressure on your back. But what really becomes interesting is the significance. Why are you choosing to behave this way right now? Why did you choose to use those words in the email right now? Why did you choose to use that tone of voice when you said that to me? All these answers to why are part of determining significance. Another way to think of it is to use the word interpreting. I'm interpreting your actions. I'm not just understanding them, but I'm interpreting them. I'm telling a story about why you've chosen to behave that way. And we're interpreting what he do, what each other does with each other all the time. Thousands of times per minute. You don't even recognize that it's happening. Now, the last two parts of this model are the path from significance to response. And here's the hard part, the fundamental irony of interaction. When somebody behaves in a way that you do not like, you are objecting to their response. But the path from significance to response, meaning... How do I respond after I have interpreted what's going on? That link is fast, involuntary, and deeply culturally conditioned. What do I mean by all that? You almost certainly can't control it. Once you have made an interpretation about what's happening, your response is immediate, it's involuntary, and you started learning it when you were three years old. And some large person told you not to behave that way, but to behave this way instead. And every time some large person gave you a rule about how to behave, you were changing the story about how I'm supposed to behave given a situation. I know you feel bad right now, young man. Don't you dare cry. Becomes a rule that says, well, if I feel bad, whatever I do, it had better not be crying. Punching him in the face is not crying, so that must be okay. Or running away so that nobody can see me crying must be okay. Or shutting my mouth and focusing my energy on, on avoiding tears forming in my eyes must be okay. Anything except crying. The path from significance to response is something that we mostly can't control. It's deeply culturally conditioned. It's part of our family culture, our regional culture, our national culture. If you have a religion, then it's part of your religious culture. And it's involuntary. It's so deeply conditioned that you almost can't control it. And I say almost for important reasons. What this means is, when I am objecting to your response, I am objecting to the part that you have the hardest time to change. The part that you probably cannot change. If I only object to your response, I won't get anywhere. The, there's no way the relationship or the interaction can improve. Because there's one more important thing about the path from significance to response. Yes, it's fast. Yes, it's involuntary. Yes, it's deeply culturally conditioned. But most importantly, it's perfectly rational. Once you have interpreted the situation, your response is always perfectly logical. I know that seems wrong, but it's true. Cognitive distortions are not about the wrong response. They're about the wrong interpretation. Think of it this way. If I grew up in the same family you did, in the same country you did, in the same religion that you did, in the same belief system that you did, with the same people that you did, if I interpreted a situation this way, I would behave the same way you do. That's the sense in which it's perfectly rational. 
So now we have the fundamental irony of interaction. The thing that I am objecting to, your response, is the thing that is the hardest for you to change. Therefore, if I keep objecting to your response, nothing will improve. If I just keep yelling at you to don't talk back to me like that, stop leaning back in your chair like that, don't you know that that's rude? Well, no, it's not rude. My back hurts, so I'm leaning back to take pressure off my back. That's perfectly rational. What's the problem? Don't you know that standing there like this is a closed stance? Everyone knows this is a closed stance. This is aggressive. No, it's not. I'm cold. This is how I warm myself up. And actually, it's true. I'm cold right now, so I kind of want to do this to warm up my hands. If you try to object, if all you do is object to the other person's response, you will not improve the situation. So go one level higher. If someone is behaving in a way that seems strange to you, that you object to for some reason, the problem isn't the response, it's probably their interpretation. They're probably interpreting the situation in a way different than you are. And I used to say that they're misinterpreting the situation, but that implies that my interpretation is correct. We have a difference of interpretation. And that difference led to a surprising reaction, a strange response. So if I don't understand why you're responding the way you are, almost certainly I can fix the problem by focusing on the interpretation. As long as I object to your response, nothing will improve. Instead, I focus on the, inter on the interpretation. So we have a few options. One of them is the law of three interpretations. So this is a trick that Jerry Weinberg taught us as a larger community. Said that when someone's response seems strange, try to think of three different ways to interpret what they're, three different ways that they are interpreting the situation, not to interpret them. Think of three different ways that they might be interpreting the situation. And if you can't think of three, you're not trying hard enough. Wait until you can think of three. Now, it's hard to do that in the moment when you want to yell at them. So at the beginning, after the yelling has ended, then you go into the corner, you pour a glass of wine, you cry for 10 minutes, and then you replay the conversation in your mind, and you try to look for three alternate ways that they might interpret what's going on in your head. And you try to think of three ways to interpret what they did, and so on. If you can think of three different ways to interpret what they, what they are doing, or you can think of three ways for them to interpret what you were doing, then you try the other trick, which is the law of generous interpretation, which is I choose the interpretation that is the nicest to the other person. So that when I see them sitting back like this, I know that being cold is one of the reasons someone might do this, and I just assume they're cold. I give them the benefit of the doubt. There's a whole bunch of, of um, intuitive ways of understanding it. But I like to think of it as the generous interpretation. Norm Kurth, in his book about retrospectives, calls it the prime directive. When you're in a retrospective, Whatever happens, you assume that everyone did the best they could with the information that was available. Instead of blaming people, you assume that, and that tends to lead to more constructive improvements. So in the beginning, you can use the satire interaction model as a way of debugging a bad interaction after it happened. Go into the corner, pour the wine, cry, play back the conversation in your head, and then try to come up with some alternate interpretations of what happened. And after a while, you start to get pretty good at this. And it starts to happen more naturally, and it happens quicker. So that in the middle of the interaction, I can be thinking about what must he be interpreting about me, and what must I be interpreting about him. And if the conversation starts to go in a bad direction, I can start thinking about different ways of interpreting the situation, and I can repair the conversation while it's happening. Then things get really good. And then after I practice that for a while, I get even better at it, it becomes easier, I can do it faster. And as I get to know one person better, I can anticipate how they are likely to interpret what I'm going to say or do next. And so I choose to do it differently in order to show them this is really what I mean. Or I say things like, hey, I have to say one of those annoying consultant things now. And what I'm doing is I'm preparing them by giving them a different way to interpret what's going to happen next. 
one of the classic North American sayings, right, is I love you like a brother, but. <laughs> That's a way of preparing them to interpret what you're about to do next in a different way than they might otherwise. And if I get to know you better and I know your tendencies to interpret certain phrases a certain way, I can change my communication style to work better with you. Then it starts to get a little bit weird because then you start getting into the meta conversation instead of having the conversation and it, 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 there are ways to get past that. But the idea, the real important part of this is to understand that if a conversation or an interaction goes wrong, trying to just tell people to stop behaving that way is not going to help. In fact, it is the least likely thing to succeed, even though it's the thing that seems like the most obvious thing to do. That's, stop staring at me like that. Stop yelling at me. I know that's what you want to say, but it doesn't work. Instead, focus on the differences of interpretation, and you'll notice that the quality of your relationships goes way up. Your stress in dealing with other people goes way down and you'll have more energy to do the rest. That's why all this stuff matters. Again, we're back to energy as the bottleneck. I care about this stuff not because it makes me a more effective human, although that's true. But if I waste less of my energy on writing shitty code, if I write, waste less of my energy on doing the wrong thing, if I waste less of my energy on trying to remember what I need to do tomorrow afternoon, if I waste less of my energy being annoyed by the way somebody behaves, if I waste less of my energy telling some weird story about how he doesn't like me, and that's the reason why we can't have a good relationship. If I waste all that energy, then all that does is push me towards burnout and depression faster. And let me tell you, you do not want to go there. I can tell you this as someone who started suffering from depression symptoms in 2003. Yeah, I wish I had learned this stuff earlier. If I had known this stuff when I was 15, my life would have been a lot different. When you pretend that it's okay for you to waste energy and you just keep doing it anyway because somebody else wants you to because you think it's not going to be a problem, you will end up in a hospital. Do not let that happen to yourself. That's why this stuff matters. I don't practice agile software development techniques because it makes me a more effective programmer. That's just a pleasant side effect. I don't, I don't focus on the, I don't uh, change the way I think about work so that I can focus on the current task because it helps me get shit done faster. I mean, that's true, but that's not why I do it. I do it because when I don't pay attention to these things, I'm throwing away my energy. I have so little of it as it is. I'm now spending 15 years recovering from depression. It's never gonna go away. My energy is lower than it used to be and it's never going to get back to where it was. I'm taking seriously the idea that energy is my bottleneck. I'm treating it like a bottleneck. One second wasted of energy is a second wasted for anything I could ever possibly do for other people. So if I want to be a better team player, I need to focus my energy. I need to focus my attention on using my energy in as constructive a way as possible. That means doing all these things, even if some of them are boring and stupid, because I know that they allow me to focus better on what I'm doing. They allow me to constantly check to make sure that I'm working on the thing that really matters now. They allow me to get feedback in short cycles about what I'm doing so that I can avoid building a mistake on top of mistake on top of mistake before it's too late. This is what allows me to use my precious energy not just for myself, but then to have some left over so that I can give it to other people. So that I can be a team player. Not just a team player in my company, not just a team player in my family, but a team player in my community. For the world, really. The ultimate team player is a better human for everyone. Taking seriously the idea that energy is my bottleneck is what allows me to be a better person. And it started by getting my own house in order. Because if I, if, when I was selfish enough to focus on fixing the problems in here, then I started to move in the direction of what Marshall Rosenberg called in or what Marshall Rosenberg always said in nonviolent communication. Another one of those culty things that I promise is not what it seems. You want to be able to give to other people with the free joy of an eight-year-old. Not because somebody expects you to, but because it feels good to do it. 
Nothing feels better than freely giving your energy to another person. You cannot freely give your energy to another person if you have no spare energy to give. That's the selfish part. The selfish part of the selfish team player is about changing the way you work and the way you live so that you have some spare energy left over to give to other people. So that you can freely give to other people, again, with the joy of an eight-year-old. Makes you a better team player, makes you a better human. That's why I care about any of this stuff. But don't tell my clients. They think it's all about efficiency and effectiveness, and yeah, yeah, that's also true. All right. I went way over time, and I apologize for that. If anyone has the energy to ask me questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. But I recognize that it's your bottleneck. For the ones of you who had the good sense to leave when you needed to leave, thank you. Anyone who sat here waiting for me to stop before they left, who really wanted to leave, I apologize. You need to be more selfish next time. And I seriously mean that. Otherwise, thank you very much for your time and attention, and I'm happy to hang, hang around and answer questions until nobody cares anymore. So did I scare you all off, or are there any questions? Yes, please! Do you have any practical hints how to keep up with that uh, 20 to 30 minutes uh, cycle of organizing work? Yeah. You can forget that work for two hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that feeling. Um, so, this is one of those things that's very difficult to practice because in the very beginning it feels painful. Have you ever actually sat with a timer, set the timer for 20 minutes, and then at the end of 20 minutes, stop? Have you ever actually tried it? Yes. Let me guess, you hated it the first couple of times that you did it, right? Like, this is the stupidest thing I ever chose to do. I don't know why anybody talked me into this. Whoever wrote the Pomodoro Technique book is an idiot. I don't know what's going on. And I felt exactly the same way. Now, the purpose of things like Pomodoro Technique which is just one style of doing it, is to retrain us to stop believing that carrying everything in our head is faster. The whole point of Pomodoro Technique is to take this seven plus or minus two idea seriously for the first time. We are not very good at managing our own short-term memory. So the practical points, the first thing is the inbox technique is critical. If you try to work in short bursts, I'll just say Pomodoro technique as an abstraction, don't believe it too much, just to have short words. If you use Pomodoro technique without the inbox technique, you are dead. Most people will not survive it. Part of what makes Pomodoro technique work is to be able to focus very carefully for those 25 minutes. And the point of the five minutes is not necessarily to rest. Are we running out of battery? The point of the five minutes is not just to rest, although that's also helpful. Part of the point of that five minutes is to then look at your inbox and see if there's anything else that you should know before you get back to work. The inbox is part of what makes Pomodoro Technique work well. The other way it works is that when your timer beeps at you after 25 minutes, probably scares you because you didn't expect it, you were so focused, you're like, ah! Immediately, you have stuff in your head. Write it down even if you know you're going to get back to it in five minutes. Write it down to practice the habit of writing down things when they come to your head. I want you as quickly as possible to reach the point where it becomes instinctive that when something comes into your head, you just write it down without even thinking. Gradually, you get to the point where you don't even look where you're writing. Okay, it might be difficult to read later, so probably you should look, but you understand what I mean. To build the habit that when an idea comes to your mind that is not this task, you don't waste any energy on it. You just write it down to get it out of your head quickly and focus back. What you're doing is retraining yourself to believe and trust this outside memory. So anyone who tries to do Pomodoro technique or monotasking and doesn't use the inbox technique, you're playing the game on a difficult level. That's the first bit of practical advice. The other thing is, 
Uh, notice, so that's why I told the story about writing something down and then I look 90 minutes later and I, ah! The whole idea of that is that was the first time that I really started to feel the power of this inbox technique that was allowing me to stop uh, trying to remember that thing. That I was able to focus on the current task and just focus, 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 and then look over here and say, okay, what's next? Ah, right, I still have to do this part. No problem, let me do that next. So certainly making sure to use the inbox technique will make something like Pomodoro technique much more effective. And look for the first time that the inbox, that your inbox reminded you of something and you realize, oh wow, I didn't waste any energy thinking about that for the last two hours. I went through for 20 minutes or however long. Right? Because you'll look at your inbox and say, I don't need to do that next. And then it's gone. And you focus again. You work for another 30 minutes. Now I need to do that. Whew. I didn't worry about that for an hour. Excellent. You can feel lighter. What happens over the first mm, probably one or two months, that's how long it takes for you to really notice that when you're doing a task, your focus is better. So the other practical technique that, or the trick that I would suggest is you need to make the commitment to practice something like Pomodoro technique with the, in, with the inbox technique. You need to commit to doing it for more than a few days. Just even if you only do it two hours a day, do it every day for a month. That might be how long it takes for you to start retraining your brain. After one month, if it still feels like nonsense, don't do it anymore. Maybe it doesn't work for you. Maybe it's just my brain. I don't know. But those are the two things that I would do. If you're going to try this, I strongly recommend that you use the inbox technique. Make sure that you have a place where you can write things down as they happen in your brain. And do it every day for a month. Even if you only do it for two hours a day or one hour a day every month. The hardest part at the beginning is when the timer sounds to actually stop. Force yourself to stop. Now, if you make a mistake and you just keep going, laugh at yourself, set the timer, try again. It's a little bit like in meditation. One thing I didn't talk about, but is related. One of the ideas about meditation is that there's no such thing as doing it correctly. As long as you continue to try, you're doing it correctly. So you sit there and you try to relax and you try to not let thoughts bother you. And then suddenly you notice, I've been thinking about this for three minutes. And you go, ha ha, and then you try again. And every time you notice, I've been thinking about this for three minutes. I don't need to think about that right now. That moment, that's success. The success is recognizing that that happened and starting again. And as long as you recognize that that happened and start again, that's the success. You don't have to feel bad about it. You just say, ah. Try again. Ah, try again. Slowly over time, it gets better. I think the same is true for working with Pomodoro technique. The first time that you just start, you know, the timer goes and you say, ah, to hell with it, I'll just need two more minutes. And then two becomes five, becomes 10, becomes 20. And now you realize that you've been typing for two hours. And then you go, ha ha, that was dumb. Let me try again. All that matters is that you say, let me try again. After a month or so, the technique is yours. Okay, is there more? Maybe the question uh, related to the second point, the organizing uh, the work. Yes, sir. On maybe if you could somehow elaborate on how to balance the working task and uh, some learning, uh, so to mm. keep up with the new technologies and so on. Right. So if you're, one of the advantages to working in short bursts is that you're not making a big commitment to work on a specific task. It's much easier to find room to learn something or to practice something if you're stopping every 30 minutes and giving yourself a chance to change tasks. So that's one thing that does help. It's like anything else. It, now, really what you're trying to do here, I shouldn't say that. One of the things that you're doing is orienting yourself towards making a smaller commitment on a particular project. When I say project, I mean it in the sense of getting things done. A project is just something that requires more than one step. So I don't mean project in the software sense. 
Part of the reason to work in short bursts is so that every, let's say, 30 minutes, you're asking yourself the question, should I work on something else now? And just the act of asking that question 12 times a day increases the chances that you will volunteer to spend some time learning, practicing some new technique, trying some new technology. So that's one part. Just the, the habit of working in smaller uh, chunks of time gives you a chance to build the habit of being willing to change tasks without the typical problems of context switching. Context switching is bad when it's involuntary, when someone interrupts you. But when it's voluntary, it actually works okay. Yes, it does take some time to get back into some task that you're working on. But part of the reason to practice Pomodoro technique is to reduce the time it takes to get back into a concentrated state. I started to notice after about six months that I could get into a focused state in only two or three minutes, not two hours or 30 minutes or whatever. So as I like to say, flow requires concentration, not time. When you feel less worried about changing tasks or being interrupted, when you can recover from it more quickly, you will volunteer to spend more of your time learning, practicing, trying new technologies. So that's part of the answer. Another part of the answer is what I call the casino technique. So the casino technique works like this. You and I are going to the casino together. So I take my wallet and I, out of my wallet, I take 100 euro and I give you my wallet and I give you my phone. And as we walk into the casino door, I say to you, this is my gambling money for tonight. When this money is gone, you have to get me out of this casino. No matter what I tell you, do not let me have my wallet. Do not let me have my phone. When this money is gone, we're done for the evening. And the idea is simple. You're trying to limit your losses. So the casino technique is really just about reserving some of your capacity to do the work that you would not do because you feel pressure to do this work instead. There's probably some main project that you work on and then there's some secondary project that you need to work on, but people will put pressure on you to do this. So you need to decide, I'm going to reserve some of my capacity to do this secondary work. And in your case, the secondary work is experimenting with some technology. Now, how does the casino technique really work in a software environment? Here's how it worked for me. For me, the secondary work was refactoring. I knew that if I didn't improve my design skill, I wouldn't improve as a programmer. I was getting tired of sort of designing myself into a corner and then in three months I would say, I can't add any more features until I throw it away and try again. Now I know what I should have done. Let me start from the beginning. That doesn't work very well. So I knew that I needed to spend some time practicing changing the design while I'm building the system. Being willing to improve the design instead of trying to throw it away and start again. But of course my managers were not paying me to refactor. They didn't understand why they should pay me to refactor. Just like maybe in your situation, you feel like you'll want to experiment with some new technology. You don't know if it's going to help the team, but you think it might. So probably you're feeling some pressure not to do that stuff. Just like I was feeling pressure not to refactor. So I decided to play a game. At the end of a task, maybe the task took one or two or three days, maybe a week. At the end of a task, I would set a timer for 30 minutes and I would refactor. Anything, didn't matter what. Just refactoring the part of the code where I was working. And my idea was, at the end of 30 minutes, in the best case, I actually improved the design a little bit, so I left the design in a little bit better position than I would have if I didn't do that. And in the worst case, eh, I'm not sure that I made the design better, but I learned a few little tricks. I learned something... I learned something that didn't work well, and then I could go on to some message board somewhere and say, this didn't work, why didn't it work? And somebody with more experience would tell me what mistake I made. And I decided that I would do this because I needed to learn something. So I would spend this 30 minutes at the end of a task. And something wonderful happened. Nobody complained. I spent 30 extra minutes finishing my task. Nobody complained. 
Manager didn't ask me why it took 30 minutes longer. Nobody was asking me why I was doing this weird refactoring work. It just took 30 minutes longer. Eh, it happens. So then I did it again and again and again. And after about one month, I realized that if I spent 30 minutes extra at the end of three days of work, nobody noticed the difference. So then I did the only sensible thing. I changed it to an hour. And I did that for about two months. Nobody noticed the difference. So I tried two hours. Uh, once or twice, people started to make comments about how long it was take, taking me to do things. So, okay. Mm. Still better than the programmers around me. Just okay. Now I have to be nervous. If I try more than two hours, it could be a problem. Now I have determined how much money I can lose. I can afford to throw away two hours of work at the end of a three-day task before people start to get nervous. I can do a lot of learning in two hours at the end of a three-day task. So part of the idea here, the casino technique, is about reserving some of your capacity to do work because it might be useful to you in the future. And we cannot predict what of that work will be useful and how much we should do. We can only experiment and hope. And if we try to do that work and three months, uh, three months pass without any improvement, then maybe we should try something else. But the casino technique is about figuring out how much time can I afford to lose? So when I reach into my wallet and I take money out and then hand my wallet and my phone to you, now the question becomes, how much money can I afford to lose tonight? And sometimes it's 50 euro and sometimes it's 500 euro and sometimes it's 5,000 euro. It depends on my situation. So the idea of what I'm suggesting to you is about trying to find how much time can I afford to lose? And if you think you cannot afford to lose any time, Think again. There is spare capacity everywhere. Don't worry. But yes. That's the recent part of the R&D. Yes, exactly. In certain environments where research and development is a first class concept, we don't have to do this casino technique in the dark. We can do it openly. That's my preference. In fact, it's a line item in a budget. So we agree openly to reserve 20% of our capacity for the R in R&D. But in many environments, it's not politically acceptable. It's not socially acceptable to sit there and learn. I don't know why, but it's like that. So before you figure out where there is a company where they take research seriously, in the meantime, you can use the casino technique and you can let's say, implicitly negotiate how much time you can afford to lose before somebody starts getting upset. As I say, you just, you try 30 minutes, you wait for angry emails. Nope. You try one hour, you wait for angry emails. You wait for the invitation on your calendar that says special one-on-one -on -one meeting. <laughs> and if it doesn't come, then you just keep doubling the amount of time until somebody starts to complain. The first complaint will not be that loud. Then you just say, oh, okay, four hours is too much, let's try two. And that works. Eventually what happens is that at some point, you make some big breakthrough. Well, maybe not big. You make some kind of breakthrough. You discover some technology that now that you understand how it works, you can show the rest of the team and it's going to save the team 150 hours of work this year. As soon as you do that once, all the time that you spent experimenting is paid back. For me, it was TDD. Yes, it made me look a little bit slower in the beginning, but after about three or four months, suddenly I was finishing my work much sooner than the people around me. I was going home at five o'clock. They were staying in the office until eight. And I just kept using that. I, essentially, I'm using my excess capacity to then sharpen my skills even more. And I reached the point where I could do my day job in two hours a day and spend the rest of the time learning. Your results might not be that extreme, but for one of you in this room, that might actually happen. Think of how wonderful your life would be if you could spend four or five hours learning something interesting after spending two hours making your manager happy. And think about also how you could reinvest that energy into making that two hours become an hour and a half and make that hour and a half become an hour. 
And then you have the option to do things like teaching it to other people around you if they're interested. Or building up that expertise to the point where you are then ready to risk starting your own company. I'm not suggesting anyone quit their job. I want that on the record. I'm not telling you anything you didn't already think about. But yeah, it really starts there. There is some amount of time that you are uh, allowed, that you can afford to spend on trying to learn something new. New technique, new technology, doesn't matter. It's there. Even if you don't believe it's there, it's there. Now the question is, it might take a few months for you to figure out how much is there. So you start slowly with something that you think will not get you fired. And then if that seems safe, you double it. And if that didn't get you fired, you double it again. And you keep going until somebody gets angry. It's okay, you can always find another job. Think, with all the skills that you learn over the two years that you practice this, you'll be ready for the next job. It worked for me. My 18th year of being a freelancer, uh, 18th anniversary of being a freelancer was just last week. All right, I think we can take time for one more question. And if there isn't one more question, then it's done. Ooh, I hear a question. Talking about the plan. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. I never recommend doing anything all the time. Never. So that's the short answer to your question. What, what, is, the, what is the deeper question? Well, it's almost always a good idea to do things reasonably. I think we can agree on that. But now we have a question of what is reasonable. And that's actually, I'm not just saying that to be funny, but I, we need to recognize that these judgments are personal judgments and that there is no absolute rule to follow. So here's my genuine answer to your question. Uh, I practiced test-driven development as much as I possibly could for a long period of time because I needed to understand the technique. I didn't even know what the technique was teaching me. I only knew two rules, write the test first and try to remove duplication. That's how I started. That was it. I didn't know anything. I just knew two rules and I tried to follow them and I was interested to see where it would go. Some people who I respected for reasons that I don't even understand anymore told me some vague promises about my life would get better. And I thought, ah, I'm making too many bugs at work, I might as well give this a try. If I keep doing what I'm doing, it's not going to work, clearly. I'm a terrible programmer, maybe this will make me better. I can try. So I did try it everywhere. And then I, after a little bit of, why, uh, of time doing that, I started to notice that it felt strange in some places to do test driven development. And then somebody told me a very simple rule. Test until fear is transformed into boredom. And in fact, this goes back to a deeper idea that, well, not deeper, but a more fundamental idea that Kent Beck wrote about in probably in Extreme Programming Explained, where he said, all methodology comes from fear. Now, I hate using the word methodology this way, because methodology means the study of methods, not a process. So let me say it a different way. We, have defined, we follow processes because we are afraid of what happens when we don't. That's the only reason to follow any kind of defined process. We follow a defined process because we had bad results before and in response to those bad results we said we're going to follow these rules and if we follow those rules we won't make those same mistakes. So TDD is like that. I do TDD, I started to do TDD because I was afraid that I would make too many bugs and I was afraid that I would design myself into a corner. So I practiced test driven development until those fears went away. Now, that meant practicing test-driven development in some areas where it seemed like overkill, where it seemed like it wasn't necessary. But my goal in that time was not to try to go as fast as possible. My goal in that time was to establish the habit of thinking about doing TDD every time, 
And then gradually I started to notice those places where I just never made a mistake. And if you go back to the Frequently Asked Questions document from JUnit, there's a section called Too Simple to Break. This was the very first time that I said, maybe I don't need to do TDD here. Maybe the code that I'm thinking of now is so simple that the only way it could break is if the compiler is broken. If the compiler is broken, I have a bigger problem. TDD will not save me here. If I'm going to write a set method where the, whether it's this dot text equals text, probably I can do that correctly by now. So I'm not going to do TDD there. I will focus my energy in the areas where I feel some fear. And what changes over time is where am I afraid? As I get better at this stuff, as I practice TDD more, I am afraid less often. So something very strange happened about uh, a month ago. So uh, when I'm in Europe the last uh, four years, my home base is in Stockholm, and I spend time working in the uh, Spotify office at Stockholm. Hi, guys. And so I've been working with them for the last four years, mostly starting with programmers, talking about programming problems, and then gradually talking about some of this other stuff. So... Uh, I've been working with one squad there. Yes, they do actually use those words from the Spotify model. So they have squads instead of teams. I'm not sure it matters, but they seem happy with it. I was working with one particular squad, and I've been working with them now for four years. And they've been trying to practice some techniques in all of these areas to try to improve their effectiveness, but they seem to notice that they just they don't refactor as much as they should. They just for some reason, they don't have the habit to do it. They don't have the impulse to do it. And so they're missing out on some opportunities to improve the design of their system. So they have that feeling like as they add more code, the code gets harder and harder to understand until gradually they want to throw it away and start again. And they couldn't understand why they kept choosing not to improve their refactoring skill. I mean, I did. I spent two solid years doing mostly refactoring. Why weren't there? So I was observing them for a while and I came up with this idea that they, they were missing the benefits of chunking. So I'll talk about this now in summary form. Chunking is the idea that in the beginning you have to concentrate on all the details and then gradually as you get more comfortable, many of the details fade into the background and you see a smaller thing. That's chunking, where you stop thinking about all the details, but instead treat it like one thing. Think about how you learned to read. In the beginning, you had to learn how to recognize the shapes of the letters. You spent a lot of energy trying to recognize that this is A, this is B, this is C. And then gradually, that became so easy that you didn't think about it anymore, and then you just saw words. But then you had to remember how the, name, how the letters corresponded to sounds, blah, blah, blah. And then after a while, you didn't see words anymore. You saw phrases. And then you could see ideas. Then you could read an entire sentence and have a picture in your head. And there was almost no effort. That's chunking. Their problem was that they were so focused on the details of how to refactor, of how to extract something, of how to inline something, of how to move code safely from one function or one object to another, that they never got to the next level where they could start to see the code move around and they could see the design improving. They were always focusing on the fine details. So I proposed an experiment. Let's spend three hours. Let's do evolutionary design, but we won't write tests. My idea was they wanted to focus on refactoring. So they wanted to focus on what are the keystrokes in their using IntelliJ idea? What are the keystrokes in idea that allow me to move code around? Let me get good at that. Let me get to the point where I don't even have to think about how to extract. I just highlight some code, extract, done. Or I don't even have to know about how to introduce a parameter. I just highlight, introduce parameter, done. I want to reach the point where those small steps become so effortless that I don't think about them anymore. I can think about the next higher level of thing. Where is the code moving? And is it actually making the design better? So I said, let's do evolutionary design. We won't write tests. We'll run the tests in our mind. I'll drive, you type. So there were three of them and me. I have this teaching example that I use. So we started building the two, first two features of my teaching example with evolutionary design. Extremely small steps. 
And I was telling them literally, okay, now go here, highlight that code, extract a variable. No, 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 don't, don't write list, list equals new array list. Type new array list, extract variable, boom. See what idea did? Okay, that's called right to left typing. Let's practice that a few more times. And we built it up like that. They were focusing on the details of how to use the IDE effectively. I was helping them, I was guiding the design. And what they could do is the person who was typing at the moment is focusing on the micro steps. The equivalent of the baby who's learning how to put their foot down and balance so that they can learn to walk. The people who were watching could see the design start to evolve in front of their eyes. And all I'm doing is removing duplication and improving names. They could start to see how those ideas translated into the design moving in this way and that way and this way and that way and here, see how it's getting better and see this line of code stabilized 10 minutes ago and it hasn't changed in 10 minutes. And then later on, we noticed that that line of code stabilized after the first 20 minutes and didn't change for three hours. That was a layer. That's the open close principle. The idea here was that tests were not the important thing. We weren't there to try to write tests. We weren't there to get feedback from the tests. We were there to do something else. And I realized, wow, if you practice test-driven development for 15 or 20 years, then suddenly you can write code really well without tests. I mean, it's good that I have the tests. And I told them, if we get into trouble, if we start getting nervous, that nervous feeling that I don't know what the code is doing, we'll write some tests. But let's see how far we get. We went three hours, didn't write a single test, the code still worked. Now, I don't know how long it takes to reach that point. I don't know how long it took me to reach that point. If I tried that experiment 10 years ago, it might have failed miserably. I know if I tried it 15 years ago, it would have failed miserably. So there is a point where writing the tests no longer is the point. The point is what's below writing the tests. Being able to refactor safely. Knowing which kinds of refactorings are going to work. Knowing that if I do these five refactorings in this sequence, the code will improve in this specific way. Knowing that if even just feeling secure in the knowledge that if I make a mistake, I can then take smaller steps and write tests again. This is related to a general principle that small steps are a good idea, but the goal of small steps is not to take small steps. The goal of small steps is so that if I take a big step and I fail, I can undo the step and make my steps smaller again and things will be more orderly. It's like the old joke, why are there brakes on a car? It's not to stop the car. It's so that you can drive faster. If you only ever drive two kilometers an hour, you don't need brakes. You just drive into the nearest building or the nearest person and you'll stop. Minimum damage. But if you want to drive 140 kilometers an hour, you probably want brakes. Small steps are there so that you can go faster. All right. Now that it's 1910, I think we should stop. So... Let me say the one thing that I like to say to every crowd here. You have some information about how to find me. If you want to ask a question, you can go to ask.jbrains.ca. If you ask me a question and you are happy to wait forever for the answer, <laughs> that service is free. If you need a better service level agreement, my rates are quite reasonable. But it's true. I have sometimes it takes me a year to answer your question, but I promise you I will answer it. Depression is a bitch. But if you ask a question, I promise that I will answer it. And typically what I do is I write an article. I give you an early version of the article. And then when I publish the article, I tell you where I've published it so that you can read the long answer. My goal is to get you a short answer quickly and then to give you a longer answer when I have the energy. And if you need better, uh, like I said, if you need a more urgent response than that, there are various ways that you can pay me. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope it helped in some small way. And if it didn't, I apologize. We'll try again next time.